Uh, Ian is the Director of Healthcare Programs for Cystic Fibrosis Canada. He is one of our longest uh, serving employees, has been with the organization for let's say more than a few years. More than a few. Uh, he, he likes to say he started when he was a child working with Cystic Fibrosis Canada. Newborn. Yeah. Newborn, yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, but uh, Ian has, uh, is also part of that incredible success that we've seen in this country. And he, there is no one within this organization, or I'd say across Canada, that knows our clinical programs uh, like Ian does. He is uh, very much instrumental in ensuring that the clinics have the funding that they uh, need to operate that we help to provide uh, and uh, those initiatives like Dr. Petter was talking about quality improvement and so on, Ian is really the one who drives all of that on behalf of our organization. So the care that your children and grandchildren and adult children and uh, friends and family receive uh, is largely uh, touched by this man right here. So. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Ian McIntosh, and he is going to talk about the healthcare programs on behalf of the Research Advocacy Healthcare and Registry team. There you go. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> we were joking earlier that, you know, who's the most technologically inept, and I think that's me. And I'm concerned about this cord, so I'm just going to stand over here because I, I don't want to know what could happen. So I, I called this what's new with the healthcare programs, but I fear that some of you have heard me talk about the healthcare programs before, but so no heckling, please. They're really cool, though. I actually really love the healthcare programs. It's just what I do. But anyway, so um, as Jeff mentioned, um, I'm uh, speaking on behalf of our research registry advocacy and healthcare program, which is kind of a tongue twister because that whole department is sort of lumped in together. I like to say that, you know, in terms of our organization, I spoke earlier about the, the volunteers that we have across the country, and there's so much work that goes into raising money. Well, then what happens to it? You know, it comes in the door, but then how does it get out the door? And we like to ensure that as much effort that goes into raising it is justified in the work that goes towards getting it out. And that's where these programs are. So we joke at the office that, you know, oh, those people over there, they make the money and we spend it. Well, in fact, that is the case. So, you know, <laughs> research, we know all about research. That's, there's been some incredible advances over the last decades and so on. And, and you know, really great promising things coming down the pipeline and so on. Um, we've got a registry, which Dr. Petter spoke so, so well about. And I mean, this is an incredible national resource that provides a statistical profile of the Canadian CF population. That's how we know the median age of survival. That's how we know, um, like all the graphs that Dr. Petter was showing, how the progress that we're making. Um, advocacy, oh my God, like that's a huge area um, with two very tiny people in that department managing an incredible portfolio, but you know, talking about newborn screening in Quebec, that's, we've got that largely because of the work of the advocacy group. We've got new drugs that are coming along that we're advocating to have support for and so on. Um, and last is the healthcare, which of course is the most important because that's my favorite. But so, um, w what are we doing for our patients right now? Well, that's the healthcare programs. The research is, you know, advances that will come. But for our patients living right now, that's the healthcare programs. And so how do we do that? What, is, what kind of programs do we have? Well, first of all, we have the incentive grants, clinic incentive grants. We've got 42 CF clinics, as was mentioned earlier. And we give grants to them to ensure, essentially, that there is CF-specific care available at the, at the, at the clinics. If you think about um, a hospital, an institution that's got numerous clinics that they host, there's you know cancer clinics and fracture clinics and diabetes clinics and so on. In terms of numbers, cystic fibrosis actually tends to be a very small disease. If you think of, say, a cancer clinic, you could have hundreds or thousands of patients, whereas a large CF clinic in Canada could be 150 patients, 200 patients. That's a large CF clinic and very resource intensive, obviously, because it's multidisciplinary care. But from an administrator's point of view, they could look at our clinic and say, well, there's only 150 patients. They don't necessarily require you know, the resources that they would give otherwise to a larger clinic. So that's where we come in. We give clinic incentive grants. And like I said, it's essentially to, well, ultimately it's to buy CF care to make sure it's available for the patients. So these clinics go toward primarily salary support. So um, in each clinic, I mean, you all know it's multidisciplinary care. There's a doctor and a nurse and a physiotherapist, dietitian, social worker, all those, those roles that go into providing comprehensive care. If we give a little bit of extra money to top up for the salaries, then it's assuring that the care is available. Typically, I think most clinics, the, the salary support from the clinic incentive grants go towards the nurse because they often will have the highest profile within the clinic. 
We also give part of that money is for travel for education, and ultimately what that is is professional development. There's, you know, as Dr. Petter mentioned, there's all these new advances coming along. There's constant changes in the care and, and devices and medications that are coming available. Well, how are, how are healthcare professionals supposed to maintain a knowledge and remain up to date on these kind of things if there's not continual education? So we give money towards that so that clinicians can travel essentially to conferences. There's one big conference that typically is sort of the big, the big hoo-ha of the year. It's called the North American CF Conference. It was in Indianapolis this year. It was just a few weeks ago. And by giving money to the clinicians to make sure that they can attend these conferences, we're ensuring that the level of care is the highest and the most up to date. Because again, if you think of a, a hospital administrator, there's no way they'll be giving money so that you know clinicians can go to a, a conference out of the country and so on. So that's how we maintain the, um, the level of care through that. We also provide a small amount of money to outreach clinics. There, there are eight clinics in Canada who in fact travel um, to other distances. For example, Toronto, sick kids, they travel to up to Sudbury a couple of times a year and they meet with clinicians up there. Um, they have a couple of days where they'll provide specific CF care and that way patients can travel to Sudbury rather than have to come all the way down to Toronto. And so again, there are eight of those clinics that operate in Canada. Um, I thought it would be interesting to sort of dig, dig back and see what kind of numbers we're talking about here. And I think it's pretty amazing the amount of fundraising that has taken place that has gone towards the clinical care. It blows my mind what you guys accomplish. If we think about just in Hamilton alone, since, okay, it's really fine writing and I forget, but I don't want to blow the big reveal. I think it's since the mid 80s, since we've been tracking this, clinic incentive grants just for Hamilton, $1.8 million which I think is pretty amazing. And that represents, so the McMaster Children's Hospital, uh, just uh, over one, almost 1 1.2 million, and the Hamilton Health Sciences, which is the adult clinic, uh, just under 700,000. Keep in mind, however, that is since 1996, because up until that time, it was a combined clinic. So uh, pediatric and adult patients were seen at the same clinic. In 1996, it split off. So that's why that number is, is what it is. So the next thing I like to talk about with the healthcare programs is the accreditation site visit program. And essentially what that is, it's the accountability for the money that we're giving to the clinics. So the money is raised, we give it to the clinics. Well, it might be kind of easy for a hospital administrator to sort of, you know, shuffle that money under the general budget and it kind of gets lost and we don't want that to happen. Thank you very much. So we run the accreditation site visit program. It provides accountability and it ensures a consistent standard of care across the country. I spoke earlier about Dr. Petter's involvement. Dr. Freitag as well has been involved with this program. And what it is, is we'll go three, four, five clinics a year. We'll take a physician and a nurse to a different clinic. We'll spend the day. We'll meet the the healthcare workers will tour the facilities, will go to the labs to see that they're using the right you know, media to detect microbiology, um, that kind of thing. We'll go to the PFT lab, make sure you, they're using the correct protocols. We'll visit the inpatient wards to make sure that the nurses on the wards have enough knowledge of cystic fibrosis care, that kind of thing. We also meet with patients and families to make sure that their impression of the clinic is the same as the clinicians because very often the patients will have different issues We'll write a report following the process and we'll make recommendations to the administration to help improve the care. And we've had some really interesting successes through this and in fact just two days ago I received an update from we had done an accreditation at the adult <coughs> clinic in Edmonton last year. Part of the follow-up process is a year later I send a letter to the clinic director and I say, oh, so we were there a year ago, we made these recommendations, how's it going? And what it does, that, that gives the clinic director an additional sort of piece of ammunition to take the, their administrator and say, you know, we've been, we've been lobbying for more nurse and you haven't given it to us and now this outside agency, who by the way gives us a bit of money, is also making the same recommendation, how's that going? It's a little more, you know, a little more advocacy, a little more incentive for the institution to, to, to sort of help out. And so, I mentioned Edmonton, we, they let me know a couple of days ago following the one year follow up, they now have uh, an upgraded nurse FTE, they were at two, uh, two FTE, so in other words two full time nurses associated with the clinic, it's a very large clinic, they're now up to 2.5 and one of them has been upgraded to a nurse practitioner role and they've also doubled the amount of social worker that they have. And that's based on the recommendations that we made through our accreditation, so I think that's quite a nice success and we've had numerous of those along the, along the years. Um, I talked about what's new. Well, this is the Health Human Resources Guidelines. This, is, um, this was published last year in the Canadian Respiratory Journal. And this was 
this outlines essentially for clinics of various sizes how much involvement of each of the roles there should be. So for example, you know, a clinic of 100, you should have this much nurse, this much social worker, and so on. And I was quite pleased to have this published. Like I said, it was published last year based on work that I had done in 2015. But interestingly and ironically, I'm talking about what's new, already this is old. So we've had some recent development. There's a lot of focus on mental health issues. The Health Human Resources Guidelines, there wasn't a huge process, or there wasn't a huge presence necessarily of mental health supports when this was done. So already we're now thinking about, oh, how can we upgrade this to include mental health? Uh, what's next? Oh, okay, these are two really cool programs. These are new. So the Clinic Incentive Grant Program that I spoke about has been around for decades. We just last year launched two new programs. We launched the Cystic Fibrosis Canada CFRD Training Support Award. We know through the Canadian CF Registry that 23.7% of the Canadian CF population has cystic fibrosis related diabetes. So roughly a quarter of the population has CF related diabetes. What we felt was necessary was to help the clinicians upgrade their knowledge in CFRD. And you know, I talked about before that the knowledge is changing and so on. So by us giving us a, a, a little support to the clinicians to have more upgraded training on CFRD, there's now extra knowledge in that. And the other really interesting um, program that we just launched this year was the Air Canada Foundation Cystic Fibrosis Canada Clinic Support Grant. And what that is, I mean, you know, corporate philanthropy being what it is, Air Canada Foundation, they had some specific goals that they wanted to see come out of their gift to Cystic Fibrosis Canada. We'll take their money, absolutely. So what that has been is, it's it's kind of vague, perhaps you'll notice, to support and improve patient care addressing both of them, what it is, essentially it's to buy equipment, which is not, in fact, Cystic Fibrosis Canada's within our mandate, but again, if Air Canada Foundation wants to give us money, we'll take it. And so some clinics have purchased um, refrigerators, bar fridges for inpatients, so that when, you know, a, a person with CF is admitted, it's typically for, you know, it can be for an extended period, and if they've got a bar fridge, they can have their own food, it means they're getting what they want rather than the institution food and so on. So it's kind of a neat program. Um, and, oh my goodness, so the clinical fellowships. So we still have a number of, dwindling, but a number of CF physicians who have been sort of the original pioneers in Canadian CF care. As these people have been retiring, we've noticed that in some areas we actually have a shortage of CF physicians, which is a problem. You know, it's a pretty specialized disease, it's pretty specialized care. We need specialized healthcare practitioners. So to get physicians, we developed this program, and I keep saying it's new because in my head it is, but it was launched in 2008. What it does is, for new physicians, it allows them, successful applicants, to, it, we're essentially buying an, a full year of additional CF-specific training. And of the 16 the recipients who have received this award from us, all 16 of them have remained in CF care, so that's a tremendous win. Two of them, in fact, are now clinic directors in Calgary and Saskatoon, and one is an acting CF clinic director, and she's in um, also Calgary. So this is kind of cool. We've got three recipients at the moment, and we, in our grant competition, which was October 1st, just this few weeks ago, um, we received four applications for the upcoming year. Now, we only can award two, potentially three, but that, that gets a nice, healthy competition going. Um, that's about all I wanted to say about the healthcare programs. Um, again, you know, these programs could not exist. Cystic Fibrosis Canada could not do the work that it does if it wasn't from the strong support of our volunteers. So I thank you all for being here today, and I thank you all for the work that you do. Just to thank you, the shortage of people looking into the CF care. Like yes, now, yes. Do we know any insights into why? Like, is it financial, opportunity based? Is it uh, all of the above. You've got it. Absolutely. Well, and again, remember I mentioned there's you know, CF is not a huge disease, so if someone is planning on focusing their full career on it, it wouldn't necessarily take up all of their time. So it, it, I think in a way we do have a slight disadvantage in attracting people, that's why this has been successful and helpful, but um, it's probably economies of scale. I have to say that our biggest win, I spoke of, you know, the one clinic director in particular who is now in Saskatoon, there might be some people who wouldn't want to move to Saskatoon, 
um, it was a, a real win to get him there and um, I think it's because of the clinical fellowship that we managed to get him sort of hooked into CF. I think you'll all find that cystic fibrosis from a, you know, a medical point of view, a clinical point of view, it's an interesting disease. There are several components associated with it. And many of our clinicians, I talked about the ones who are still our original guard from way back when, it's an interesting disease that sort of gets people hooked. It's, it's fascinating. It's, there's tremendous advances in it. And it also deals with really, really great people. So yeah, uh, that was a roundabout answer to say, yeah, there's a whole bunch of reasons why we can't necessarily track physicians.